Aloha, my name is Brianna Govea, Program Specialist at the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center. On behalf of the Hawaii State Judiciary, mahalo for joining our live program. I hope everyone is well and staying safe as we progress through the state's reopening phases together. With us tonight to reflect on the recent COVID lockdown measures is Robert Thomas, attorney at the law firm Damon Key Leon Kupcha Castor. Robert is also the managing attorney for the Pacific Legal Foundation's Hawaii Center, a nonprofit legal foundation dedicated to protecting property rights and individual liberties. Between his lawyering duties, Robert serves as the Joseph T. Waldo Visiting Chair in Property Rights Law at William & Mary Law School in Virginia, and is also Editor-in-Chief of the American Bar Association's Legal Journal on Municipal Law, The Urban Lawyer. Robert was featured on the 2020 Best Lawyers in America list and was recently elected as a member to the American Law Institute. Before we begin, I want to remind our live audience that you can send in questions through the, through the webinar's Q&A box at any time during the program, and Robert will respond to them after his presentation. This program is being recorded and it'll be posted on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash JHC Hawaii. Well, thank you, Robert, for lending your expertise on how our constitutional rights and civil, civil liberties um, come into play amid the pandemic. I know many of us have had to adapt to a lot of new changes we've never encountered before. Um, and I know we're all looking forward to, to your wisdom and your insight on this matter. So please take it away. All right, thank you. One of the things we're all adjusting to is uh, having these type of programs over Zoom. Uh, you know, I've, I've been a multiple attendee of the in-person programs that the center has put on over the years, and I'm glad you're keeping up with doing it online, even though we can't meet in person. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and I, you know, I can't see you all, so forgive me, um, but I, I understand that we have participants from all over, not just Hawaii, so I'd better say good evening to some of you as well. And I do want to thank you, uh, Brianna, and the King Kamehameha Five. Uh, Judiciary, Judiciary History Center for asking me to present the program, which as you can see, the title of which is The Constitutional Law and States of Emergency, Lessons from Hawaii's Judicial History for the COVID-19 Pandemic. And here's how we've mapped out uh, the next hour. So for somewhere between the first 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to try to download to you uh, what I think you need to know to understand the legal context of the ongoing situation. We'll take a look at Hawaii's Major Law on Emergency Management, Chapter 127A of the Hawaii Revised Statutes, to see where the, how the power to respond and plan for emergencies is distributed, and if there are any limitations on those powers. Then second, what we're going to do and this is why it's really appropriate that we're here at the Judicial History Center, we're going to look at how Hawaii's courts have dealt with emergencies, including public health questions uh, and the like over the years. After all, we have a very, very long and, and in many cases unfortunate history of successive waves of public health crises, particularly in the 19th century. You know, there might be a great, a very good argument that Hawaii's history is in large part in the uh, 19, 18th and 19th centuries defined by these series of progressive of waves of, of public health crises. Uh, what we're looking at here is a, an actual report of a smallpox uh, outbreak in the early uh, 1800s in Hawaii. Um, and our courts, as a consequence of that, have some deep experience in evaluating uh, legal claims. And what I'd like to do is spend some time uh, with you trying to figure out if there's any lessons in, in those cases, those older cases, primarily from the 1800s, uh, for uh, how a court may look at uh, uh, claims today. So my goal for the afternoon is to give you a better understanding of where we are how we, as we as lawyers and, or, or maybe judges, look at the legal questions that arise when our government is given a lot of power to respond to an emergency, but not so much to discuss with you what our, our government's policies should be, or whether the government is responding appropriately or correctly to the current crisis, but rather to give you some insight about how a court 
or a judge might evaluate legal challenges to government's emergency powers because two lawsuits have been recently filed both in federal court. And we'll take a look at, at what I think is the primary claim that they assert and, and how a court might treat them. So it's, it's, you know, we're really not trying to discuss what's necessarily right or wrong, um, but more about what is, in other words, how the courts will look at these things. And then third, what we're going to do is we've saved some time to respond to some questions. Some of you have already sent in some, and I've got the answers to those brewing in my head, um, but there's also the, uh, the question function, and then uh, Brianna will, will provide those to me, and I'll do my best uh, to answer those. And the only note I have is, of course, the lawyer's note is that I can't give specific legal advice. Uh, and my responses will be about general principles. And if you have questions about a particular situation and what rights or responsibilities that those involved might have in that situation, the usual caveat applies, go hire a lawyer. So let's get started. Um, before we get into the powers that the government, the governor to prepare and respond to emergencies, including public health emergencies, a little bit of background I'd like you to keep in mind. I often hear things uh, that give me pause as a lawyer, things like emergencies give the government greater power than it usually has, or the flip side of that uh, thought, our constitutional rights become more limited during an emergency. Um, and if you take nothing else away from today's talk, I'd like you to take this away. The government power doesn't increase, nor do our rights decrease simply because an emergency is ongoing. In other words, there are limits on government power, even in unusual times. And boy, oh boy, these times we're all experiencing today are certainly unusual. Uh, the Constitution was designed to work equally as well in times of calm and in trying times. The Supreme Court reminded us of this in a case decided during the Great Depression. And what I'd like to do is I, I hate reading from quotes from Supreme Court cases, but I do think this one is particularly relevant. I'd like you to, to, to uh, pay special attention to the words and we'll fast forward through some of our slides and I will call that one up right here. Emergency, this is the US Supreme Court in a case out of, out of Minnesota. And it's in the middle of what might have been the greatest economic emergency the United States ever experienced, the Great Depression, right? You look at the, the date it was decided, January 8th, 1934, right in the heart of the Depression. And the court held this, emergency does not create power. Emergency does not increase granted power or remove or diminish the restrictions imposed upon power granted or reserved. The Constitution was adopted in a period of grave emergency. Indeed, can you think of a more... Uh, uh, important emergency in our history than the Revolutionary War. Its grants of power to the federal government and its limitations of the power of the states were not determined in light of emergency and they are not altered. That's pretty strong stuff. So I'd like you to strike from your mind the idea that our rights are suspended in any real or, or as some might say, an imagined emergency. And what this tells us is that, uh, you know, you, you have rights uh, they're not, they don't go away by virtue of the fact that we're, we're in a declared emergency, whether you believe it or not, um, and that we should all, I think, uh, keep in mind that, you know, we're, we're good citizens and, and uh, we know our rights, but like everything else, you have to be careful about when you exercise those rights, uh, because in this case, I think, uh, you know, for example, we're in a pandemic and uh, the public health is important. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean you go off and, and defend your rights as much as you can, um, but you have to make that judgment call. And, and on this one, I always go back to the idea that, uh, you know, I ask people, what's the first thing we stock up on in emergencies in Hawaii, right? Everybody else on the mainland will go out and grab toilet paper, but, you know, I brought along, what do we, what do we stock up on in Hawaii? We stock up on spam. And so maybe this is your reminder that, you know, Pay attention, keep, a, keep watch, vigilance on what your government is doing, um, and keep in mind that you have those rights, but at the same time, stock up on your spam, because that, you know, sometimes the better action is to simply hold tight and spam up than it is necessarily uh, to, to file lawsuits and that sort of thing. But one of the things that we're going to do in this session is try to see when are those times when you should put the spam down and pick up you know, the law, 
tonight. I've got another prop here. Pick up, pick up your emergency statute and see what the limitations are. Well, anyway, with that background, uh, let's, let's go into a, a little bit of something. If I was to ask you, for example, how many constitutions do we have? You know, the first answer that a lot of people pop into their mind would be, well, one, we've got the United States Constitution, and that's the one that I think all of us, lawyers and non-lawyers alike, think about when we talk about the Constitution. You know, we, we throw terms around like the Fifth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, pleading the Fifth, you see that in cop shows and the like. But some of you might, you know, be a little more technical and then say, no, 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 we have 51 constitutions, right? We have the U.S. Constitution plus the Constitution of all, every state. And we in Hawaii are very aware, I think, of the differences between our Hawaii Constitution and the United States Constitution. And there are some limitations on government power that don't exist under the United States Constitution, um, but, that all, but that exist and limit the power of the state government under the state Constitution. And it's equally important. But the one thing I do want to, to talk about is what I call the third constitution. Um, that's uh, the one that, uh, it, that it's not the one that we talk about in the paper and, and everything else. It's the popular constitution. And that's the one that exists in the mind of all of us. And I would say that most people, for example, don't know the detailed constitutional parameters of Fifth Amendment doctrine or First Amendment doctrine, but we all know that we have a right to free speech, we have a right to practice our religion. You know, I've referred to it before as the playground constitution, maybe, the rules that somehow we all know are the law, and we don't know where we learn them, uh, and that we all believe that we have to follow. You know, the classic one is finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? That's a, that's a hard and fast rule of law on the playground. Try to convince any kid that's not true. Or the other one, the, the classic Fifth First Amendment uh, playground law. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater. You know, every Fifth First Amendment lawyer will go bananas when somebody says that because that's probably not true. You probably can shout fire in a crowded theater uh, in certain circumstances. Or the other one that was brought up recently uh, in an actual Supreme Court oral argument uh, in, at, at the United States Supreme Court by Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who said, I learned as a kid that possession was nine-tenths of the law, you know? Um, so uh, my point of this is try to split in your mind what you think the law, the Constitution is, and what, from what it, you think it should be, because sometimes there's a vast difference between the two. So I know it's hard, um, and we all do it, but with that in mind, let's begin. Um, one more thing. I, I want to dispel the idea that we've heard the war analogy thrown around. We're at war with COVID. Um, this is war footing and whatnot. So I'd like to say that, that uh, this isn't a war. An emergency is definitely not a war. There are provisions in the law for martial law, and we in Hawaii certainly have experienced that, you know, some of our elderly, uh, you know, my own uh, mother survived, lived under martial law in Honolulu for three years during World War II. Um, but let's dispel that notion. This isn't a war, it's an emergency. It's a public health emergency and a very severe one and a serious one, but we're definitely not in a war. Um, all you have to do is think of the infamous Korematsu case uh, to see how, uh, uh, an invocation of war power is among the most extreme that the government can do. And it does give, in some cases, the government much more power than it would have in an emergency. Um, for example, I mean, a case from history, the US Supreme Court has said that if uh, an army b intentionally blows up a private railroads, uh, tracks and stations, that it cannot, the, the government, the federal government can't be liable for the destruction. And you say, well, how can that be? Well, it turns out that these were rail lines in the American South during the Civil War, and the Union Army blew up the property uh, in order to prevent it from falling into the hands of the rebel army. After the war, the railroad sued the federal government and saying, you blew up my train tracks, and you blew up my stations, and I want to be compensated and the case made its way to the US Supreme Court. Well, the court was not having any of it and said ultimately, no, can't do, sorry, uh, some things happen during war and the reason that those were, your property was blown up was to prevent it from falling into the hands of the enemy. And if that's the case, 
fortunes of war, sorry, you lose, not our problem. More modern example is during the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in 1941 and 1942, the American army in retreat blew up uh, uh, some, it was a, a petroleum facility privately owned by an American company. And the same claim was made. You blew up my, my gas facility, my, my petroleum processing facility. And of course the army responded and said, we had to do that because it, other than that it would have fallen into enemy hands. And the Supreme Court of the United States rejected a claim for compensation after the war made by the petroleum company. So let's, you know, those are extreme times. We're not there. And, and I don't think well, obviously we're going to get there. And this is a war, this is an emergency and not a war. So let's also keep that apart. Well, let's take a look at Hawaii's emergency preparation and response laws. Now, in when was it? it it's chapter 127A of the Hawaii Revised Statutes, if any of you want to look it up. And if any of you do, don't worry about trying to find it, because what I will do is after, after we get off this, uh, this session, probably no later than tomorrow, I will post up on my blog um, links to where you can go actually read the law and the cases that we're talking about tonight. So uh, before it was stand, so don't worry about taking notes. It will all be there. Um, before it was substantially revised in uh, tw uh, 2014 and again in 2017, Hawaii's civil defense and emergency laws were kind of a hodgepodge with pieces scattered all over the code books and the administrative rules. And what happened was in 2014, the legislature decided to overhaul and consolidate all of these scattered laws. Now the legislature really wasn't changing the substance of a lot of these laws, just bringing them in under one roof and then updating practices to what would then have been current best practices and then clarifying that the governor uh, for statewide emergencies and that the mayors of each county for local emergencies have the major responsibility for preparing for and responding to emergencies. So first, the question is, what is an emergency, right? Let's take a look at that. Let's see what the law says here. We will go to there. Um, an emergency means any occurrence or immediate threat, imminent threat thereof, which results or may likely result in substantial injury or harm to the population or substantial damage to the loss of property. I mean, that's pretty broad stuff, right? Almost anything. You can see how, how circumstances uh, could be one way or the other. There's some nuances there, but uh, emergency is very, very broadly defined in our law. So that leads us to our first legal question. Who gets to decide whether COVID or a tsunami on the way or inbound uh, uh, North Korean missiles is really an emergency? Well, here's the statute and, and the statute gives us the answer and it says it right there in the highlight. The governor or mayor shall be the sole judge of the existence of the danger. So no one but the governor or mayor shall be the, the judge of what that is. That means for all of you, the legislature, uh, legislators don't say what an emergency is. Courts very likely will not interject and tell you that, oh, this is not really an emergency, it's something else. So, you know, I'd like to go back and say, well, how does that work with, let's say, the, outs the situation here? You know, you walk down the street, this is downtown, looks pretty normal. That's not an emergency, right? We've heard some of that coming from folks who said, well, this isn't really an emergency going on. You know, I, I, the, the, the legislature has delegated the authority to make that call to the governor and to the, and to the various mayors for county emergencies. So who can challenge the governor, right? The sole judge, boy, that's really strong stuff. So let's take a look at what happens to, um, or, or what can the governor do if he or she declares an emergency? Um, again, very strong stuff. They can require quarantine or segregation of persons who not only are infected or believed to have been exposed to infectious, communicable, or other disease that in the governor's opinion is dangerous to the public health. It can take over property, commandeer or requisition it, it can suspend all sorts of laws, um, you know, and we've seen some of that in action in the governor's orders. It can suspend any law that imp impedes or tends to impede or be detrimental to the expeditious 
and efficient execution of conf or conflicts with emergency functions. Boy, that is, you'd almost might call that a blank check in some ways. Um, it can regulate the way utilities operate. It can take over resp emergency responsibilities from local control, meaning from the, from the mayors if, if necessary. It can require evacuation of the civilian population. And it can most, maybe most importantly, it can control the economy, set prices, prevent hoarding, um, all sorts of things, suspend holidays, big deal, um, adjust the hours for voting, and assure the continuity of services by critical infrastructure facilities. So the, the major vibe you get out of this, I think, or that you should take away from this, is in the statute, the legislature has delegated to the governor very, very broad powers um, to respond to an emergency. And these don't even, the ones I just listed, don't even cover the powers that the governor has in times of non-emergency to prepare for emergency. And there's a special statute on that, and I don't want to get into that and read all of it, but essentially the governor can do take all steps necessary to prepare for an emergency, um, short of suspending laws and doing things like that. And we see that in the in, in the executive branch's preparation through things like the Hawaii Mer Emergency Management Agency and whatnot. But it can take undertake some very severe things, even in the absence of a declare declared emergency. Again, pretty strong stuff. And what I'd like to do is walk you through some of the features of the law. Uh, um, the, the question is here, let's go forward, right? And there, state of emergency. So in a declared emergency, the, the law makes a distinction between normal times and a declared state of emergency. And that under our law, a, declare, a declaration of an emergency triggers all sorts of things, including those powers that I just walked through that the governor may exercise. And so the governor may declare the existence of a state emergency in the state by proclamation. We saw that coming uh, from Governor Ige in March. Um, what else? The mayor, of course, a mayor, may declare the existence of a local state of emergency within the county. Okay, good. So the mayor has a, you know, what I would call very muscular powers uh, during, by virtue of the fact that she or he declares an emergency to exist by proclamation. Three, the governor, and this is the provision we just looked at earlier, the governor or mayor shall be the sole judge. Again, very strong stuff. No one can second guess whether there is in fact an emergency. And so the question becomes, what limitations, if any, are built into the law to make sure that, I mean, we don't have a king anymore, right? Uh, we have a, we're a, a representative democracy. And as I mentioned earlier, that doesn't halt simply because we're in the middle of a public health or other emergency. So what, if any, uh, backstops are there in the law built in? And I want you to take a look at the next one because it's become the subject of two lawsuits. Um, this is, uh, you know, in other words, are there strings attached to the exercise of power? And the short answer to that is yes. Uh, and the strings are pretty significant. It's what I call the automatic termination limitation. And let me quote it for you because the words are going to be important. And here it is. So part D of the statute says that a state of emergency and a local state of emergency shall terminate automatically 60 days after the issuance of a proclamation of a state of emergency or local emergency, or by separate proclamation of the governor or mayor, whichever occurs first. The statute, this statute, Hawaii statute, is a lot like the limitation put on governors from other states. So most states have something similar to this, and as far as my research can tell, only two or three, for example, delegate the emergency power to their governors indefinitely. So, for example, one state says a governor may exercise emergency powers as long as the state of emergency exists, but that's definitely in the minority. Um, some other states delegate it to the governor, like ours, for a limited time um, with the ability expressly to renew or extend the emergency. You know, you, know, you can't, I mean, the emer present COVID emergency um, illustrates well that some emergencies aren't, don't, let's say, take place less than 60 days. They last longer than that. And you certainly don't want the governor to be deprived of the power to respond to them simply because something is going on for longer than 60 days. 
but those states that recognize limitations on the governor's power defined by time then tell you what happens next. They say, for example, uh, the legislature has to weigh in either approving an extension uh, or by not disapproving it. But our statute is the only one, as far as I can tell, that says a declaration of an emergency has an expiration date, kind of like the poll date on your spam here, um, but doesn't expressly say what happens if the emergency goes on. So there are three ways you can think about this that an emergency can end under Hawaii law. First of all, it expires by its own terms. For example, the governor's declaration of emergency, when he first issued it back in March, said it would end, I think it was on the 23rd of April. Um, so that's one way, it can just end by its own terms. The governor says, I declare that there's an emergency and it will last this long, some time period less than 60 days. Second, it can end if the governor issues, and you'll see the word right here, um, on the second to last line, a separate proclamation. And that separate declaration, I think, the way that this is most naturally read, is that it means should require a new declaration that automatically terminates the existing declaration um, and essentially reboots the whole process. So it doesn't deprive the governor of the power to continue, in essence, to respond to an emergency but he has to follow certain procedures by which to do it because uh, rather, you know, anyway. Um, and then the final thing is the last, the last way, 60 days expire and the thing is automatically terminated. I mean, that's pretty strong language. Um, shall terminate automatically. That leaves very little room to interpret that to say that it goes on, somehow survives uh, 60 days and not, is not automatically terminated. And there's not too much to tell us what, if anything, to tell us what the legislature meant when it imposed this 60-day limit. Um, and I think the most reasonable way to read the words is that it gives the governor a lot of power for 60 days um, and then, you know, to act quickly and decisively as needed to respond. But the longer the emergency goes on, and, the, you know, our COVID thing is a very good example than that, the more the governor's power becomes limited. Of course, he or she can always issue a separate proclamation and essentially reboot the process. Um, but if he doesn't, then the power to respond to emergencies doesn't simply disappear and we're left powerless. It simply goes back to where it naturally resides and that's in the people's representatives of the legislature. So what's happened here? I think a lot of you who are signed into this understand what's going on because you probably find you're not listening in if you're not following along uh, in, the, in, the, in the press and elsewhere. The governor has issued a series, uh, initial, in, issued an initial proclamation back in March um, that was for less than 60 days, the, 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 the period. Um, and then as, as the emergency continued, um, rather than issue separate new uh, uh, proclamations, the governor um, ex effectively extended uh, the effective date uh, I think at first to April 29th, and now I think it is what, the latest one, the ninth supplemental is now at ju on July 31st. So through a series of what the governor has labeled supplemental um, declarations, and here let's pull up, uh, uh, you know, if you wanna find these, go to the website, uh, governor's website, and you can see both the governor's initial emergency proclamation there at the top, um, and then as we went through a series of what the governor called supplemental emergency proclamations. So, and, and one argument that we look at as lawyers is that, well, you know, uh, all the statute requires in this situation is a separate uh, proclamation. And that, you know, physically be a physically separate proclamation is good enough. We don't care. Uh, perhaps what uh, the label is, whether it's called a, a uh, supplemental proclamation, whether it's called a, uh, what is the statute term here? Let's go back, whoops. The statute calls it a separate proclamation. You know, that might be one argument. Uh, uh, literally issue a separate document, call it what you will, end of story. The countervailing argument that, that I think has a little more weight under Hawaii law uh, is that it would, it, 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 if that were true, then what the statute really delegates to the governor is indefinite authority uh, to respond as long as she or he thinks is necessary. 
And if that's what the legislature intended, then I don't think they would have included a 60 day limitation in that. They would have simply done what those two other states I mentioned done earlier and said the governor has in, indefinite power to respond to an emergency or simply said silent. And I think this is a very important, uh, you know, the, the whole point of subsection D and the 60 day automatic termination provision is that it adopts a separation of powers limitation uh, on the governor's emergency power and reminds us as people uh, that our representatives, the legislature has a, a definite voice in this. At some point, the governor is going to have to come back to either the legislature or the people themselves and, and uh, make his case for why there's a continuing an emergency. Um, and two federal court lawsuits have been filed in the last few days challenging the legality of the governmental supplemental proclamations. They also raise a whole bunch of other claims under the Constitution, both the Hawaii Constitution and the federal Constitution. But I think that their claim for 60 day pull date is one of the most prominent. And I think that Hawaii, a court decision will turn at least in part on how the Hawaii Supreme Court over the years has responded to these claims. Now, here's where we're gonna get into sort of the most interesting historical aspect of this. Let's take a look at some of that judicial history. Um, long line, right? We've got a long line in Hawaii of understanding of, of this. It goes back to, I mean, that's today, but uh, we've, uh, we, I say collectively, we have experienced successive waves of health crises, smallpox, measles, bumps, uh, rube uh, influenza, and even sort of the famous case of the bubonic plague uh, a number of times. Uh, the latest, you know, in 1900, this is a picture of when, when government officials accidentally burned down Honolulu, uh, a large part of downtown Honolulu, when they purposely started fires to respond to an outbreak of bubonic plague. Of course, there's no more famous example of Hawaii's response to uh, a disease than the quarantine site for victims of Hansen's disease on Molokai. And how many of you knew that the original name, and it's right down here in the corner, Sand Island, was actually Quarantine Island? So what today we know as Sand Island is actually a dredged and filled uh, version of what was known for many years in Honolulu as Quarantine Island. It is literally where they would bring people inbound on boats and make them go through quarantine. So, you know, and those are just health-related emergencies, right? We've had revolutions, overthrows, uh, enemy attacks, Pearl Harbor, martial law, uh, rounding up of, of Americans and putting them in some internment camp in, in Hono Uli Uli, hurricanes, tsunamis, and even as I mentioned before, right, we, we recently had the, uh, the fake news uh, inbound North Korean missile alert, which thankfully was fake news. So let's take you back to 1880 in a case decided by the Hawaii Supreme Court. Let's go. There we go, right, 1880. So if you want to dust off, go down to the law library and you get a chance and dust it off. Kingdom officials, and this is back in kingdom days, prohibited commercial laundries within a certain radius of an intersection of Nu'uanu and King Street. Now you guys know what's, what's the neighborhood that starts at Nu'uanu Avenue and goes ever? Well, that's Chinatown, right? That's true back then. So the, the supposed point of all this was that it was believed that the dirty laundry water hurt the public health. But, um, uh, other parts of town uh, outside of Chinatown were not subject to the restriction that they couldn't dump, they couldn't operate commercial laundries, uh, they, or they could operate commercial laundries elsewhere on the island and within the kingdom. And within Chinatown, only commercial laundries were banned, even though there was evidence to show that non-commercial laundries were just as guilty of dumping dirty water uh, into the streams and elsewhere and causing disease. And so Mr. Tong Lee objected and, and, and challenged it and said, this violates my constitutional rights. Now the Hawaii constitution uh, then and now contains many provisions that we, the federal constitution today, the US constitution uh, 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 sees as, as, as the, much the same way. And the Hawaii Supreme Court rejected the challenge and said the government officials had a good reason for doing it and even if the ban was over-inclusive or under-inclusive. So in other words, they rejected Mr. Lee's claim that, hey, wait, you're not banning all commercial or all laundries within this district, even if they produce the same amount of uh, disease, wa you know, disease-inducing vector water, and you're not banning commercial 
uh, operation laundries outside of this area. So come on, this, this, you can't do this. And the Supreme Court rejected the challenge. But no. Um, uh, so th this is merely the government doing what the government does. The government, the court held, has very, very strong power to respond and, and, and regulate conduct for the benefit of the public health. So the courts back then and to today pay a high degree of deference to the government's assertions that it has to regulate conduct or property or other things uh, for the benefits of the public health. Um, and this was not even an emergency measure. It was simply a commercial measure. You add in the fact that there was an emergency, uh, a, a known public health emergency, and this is a case that was decided three or four years later, uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court was asked whether the transport of victims of Hansen's disease to Molokai, as well as to, or Kalapapa, as well as to, there was a, uh, a, sta a quarantine place in Kaka'ako. It would, under the regulations of the kingdom, be allowed to deport, essentially deport people and transport them against their will to these locations. And the court had no problem doing it, even though there wasn't a showing that someone necessarily had leprosy or, or, or Hansen's disease, that they were simply uh, uh, perhaps could get it. The court said this is such a, a, a poor function of government that we as judges will not interfere. So that's one thread I want you to keep in mind. The other thread that I want you to keep in mind, and this is a case that uh, arose out of what became known as, and I want to get the, 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 the term right. It's the, the case was a ship called the Madras, M-A-D-R-A-S, um, and it became known as the Madras Affair. And it, it, in, if you look back into not only the judicial reports of the time, but into the newspapers of the time, what happened was a ship was inbound with immigrants from southern China, 600 of them. The captain reported that there were some people on board who were exhibiting signs of smallpox. Uh, and the regulations of the kingdom at the time sa said that anybody uh, who has to go into quarantine uh, could be required to pay for the costs of quarantine because, well, if you want to come in and it turns out you need to be quarantined, there's no reason that the kingdom should have to pay for that. Seems like a reasonable regulation. What happened was the, the kingdom's government did not actually put the ship into official quarantine on Quarantine Island. Instead, it held the ship offshore for about two months in these repeatedly or repeated um, uh, orders holding it off the port. And when people started jumping ship trying to swim ashore, the kingdom government hired people security to keep people on the ship. Well, eventually, two months later, they let them land. They go through formal quarantine um, and, and do what they needed to do. And But what happened was the government then sued the owners of the Madras, saying, you owe us the money that we had to go out and hire security uh, to keep your uh, potentially infected persons on the ship. Uh, and what happened was, in this case, you'd think, well, based on the earlier cases, decisions rendered by the Supreme Court of Hawaii, that they might say, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable exercise of the government's power to protect the public health. But it didn't in this case. It, it had a technical reading of the definition of the term quarantine. And the court said, well, this you were holding the ship. You kept it offshore, but it doesn't fall into the formal definition of quarantine, which is letting the ship land, uh, having the people on board go through health screening, sequestering those who have it or may have the disease, and then letting the ship itself go. Um, and in that case, it was unfair for the kingdom to hold the ship liable. So it's those two decisions, the Tong Key decision on one, the Tong Lee decision on one hand, where the court said, hey, if it's for the uh, public health, we're going to give a lot of deference. And yet, just four years later, the same Supreme Court uh, ruled that we're going to, even when the public health is at stake, we're going to examine these statutes and these regulations quite closely. And I think both of those themes are what's going to come up as our courts in Hawaii um, start tackling these problems. And before we, uh, so with that in mind, you know, one, one more look. Um, how are these lawsuits playing out? The two lawsuits that were just filed, 
you know, I can't predict how the court will will respond to them. I mean, they're pretty substantial lawsuits, and both of them are essentially based on the idea um, that the governor's emergency power expired at 30 days and that he did not renew it in the proper way as required by the statute. Is this going to be a case where the court looks at it like the laundry regulations and said, well, they're trying to protect public health? Uh, uh, so we're going to give uh, the government a lot of deference and leeway on that? Or is it going to be a case where they're saying, look, there's this delegated power and uh, 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 it can be enforced uh, not just by the legislature, but by you know individuals, and that we're going to have a very narrow reading of this statute. So you know who knows, right? But I think those are the two cases that will play out or that should play out in the way that the court analyzes these things. So what they tell me, and before we get to your questions and, and a few takeaway points, what this case, those cases tell me is that generally speaking, I think the courts will be very deferential to a governor or the, go or the government's assertion that it needs to do something in order to protect the public health but that at the same time, there are limits and the courts aren't simply going to rubber stamp whatever uh, the other branches say is necessary simply because they say it's necessary. The rules still matter, uh, the law matters, and our rights aren't necessarily tossed aside uh, simply because it's emergency. So let's wrap up before we get to the questions with some takeaway points. Um, Keep in mind, if the government, the governor can commandeer property now and pay later. Um, if the government takes over your business, which so far hasn't happened uh, in our jurisdiction, fortunately, constitution requires full payment. Um, and and you know, but but the one that's come up and I've seen repeatedly is what if the government or can the government dis discriminate essentially between businesses that are deemed essential. Uh, versus non-essential and order the non-essential businesses to shut down? Chances are yes. Remember this, there's a famous case from the 1920s, or I'm sorry, early part, earlier in the uh, 20th century, 1905, I believe it was, when the U.S. Supreme Court in a case called Jacobson against Massachusetts held that the government can force you to get a vaccine. And if it can do that, in other words, you know, invade your bodily integrity, it very likely can tell you to stay home without serious judicial interference and or if you go out to wear a mask. And, and that decision, Jacobson against Massachusetts, is one that is still good law today and was recently, I think it was about 10 days ago, uh, cited by the Chief Justice of the United States of why these decisions, for the most part, are not cases for court resolution, but are for legislate, you know, the, the political branches, in other words, the people that you and I elect. So let me, let me leave you with this. Again, this is an emergency, not a war. Uh, we still have rights. We have to guard against inroads on those rights. Um, you know, and again, stocking up on spam, yay. Um, but the big danger, I think, is when this is all done, uh, the worst measures, uh, in my experience, are those adopted in emergencies, you know, because our tendency is to look for certainty in the law and we're willing to give up much more of our rights than we really need to. And the one thing I would suggest that could do the best is this has been an extreme test case for our statute, and I think it has problems. So I would hope that the legislature would go back and amend, or at least take a harder look at this, this, whoops, this statute right there, number D, and clarify what happens after 60 days. You know, is the gov does the governor get to renew? Does the power devolve to the legislature? Does the legislature get a veto power? Uh, what happens? Because I think there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty caused by the way the statute is written. Um, so I think it needs desperate, desperately needs amendment. Maybe not right now in the middle of the pandemic, um, uh, but, but, but soon thereafter. So I think that would go a long way into clearing things up and giving us and the public a lot of understanding of, of what the rules might be, because right now it's all dependent on whether the governor issues these supplemental uh, declarations that, that continue the emergency ongoing in this end, what seems to be an endless series of renewed times. So Brianna, are you, are you ready for questions? I pinged over maybe about five minutes, but I'm hoping we still have time for some of our questions that we can get to. Yes, I, 
am. Can you hear me? Is the audio? I can, I can hear you just fine. Okay. So our first question is just can you um, speak a little bit more about how depriving a small business of its right to operate constitutes a taking? Okay, well that's, you know, the, we, uh, we could do a whole hour on that question. Uh, the short story is it probably doesn't, unless in the, in the most extreme circumstances. And mm. so far, you know, we've had some inquiries. We do, we do takings law in our office. And we've had a few inquiries over the last couple of months of whether these shutdown regulations are takings. Um, because, you know, uh, by forcing me to go out of business temporarily, uh, mm -hmm. Or, you know, in a worst case situation, even permanently, let's say if business goes under, uh, as we've unfortunately seen a lot of businesses do, um, is that uh, the same thing as an exercise of eminent domain? And again, this is what the law is, not necessarily what it should be, but the short answer is there's probably been around 10 to 15 of those type of claims filed in other courts around the country, and not one has been successful. I haven't seen a situation that would conform to existing law that would show these to be takings where you can get compensation if you're shut down. Doesn't mean that the situation isn't out there, I just haven't heard of it yet. So mm -hmm. the takings test under law is very tough. Um, uh, and it's a, all it says is essentially the government has to have exercised eminent domain over your property. So mm -hmm. uh, be vigilant, uh, look for those cases, but so far I haven't seen any ones that I think uh, are, e are cases calling for compensation. Thank you, thank you. Um, another hopefully quick question is how can mm -hmm. short-term rentals be classified as non-essential when many are housing out-of-town first responders? Right. This goes, I think this goes to the question of, of the, how closely tailored does the regulation need to be? Can it be over-inclusive or under-inclusive? So that reminds me of the claims a lot that were made in that laundry case that, you know, the Lee case, Lee against the kingdom um, uh, that we, we spoke about earlier. And in that case, of course, the law was over and both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. And the kingdom Supreme Court said, that's not for us to decide. Um, I think there would be a strong vibe of that in the case. Yet at the same time, if you look at the, the Madras case that just happened four years later, same court said, well, you know, there has to be some limits on this sort of thing. Can mm -hmm. a regulation making these kind of distinctions become wholly irrational? There's absolutely no reason to make this distinction. And, and here's why this is such an interesting question. The modern Hawaii Supreme Court, starting in cases probably about 10 years ago, said in these type of claims, it modified uh, the Tong Lee decision somewhat and said it's not just those cases in which there's a, there could be a reason one way or the other. It said it's the government's burden to prove that the distinctions that it's making are actually rational. So I think those new rules coming from more modern cases all decided within the last, oh yeah, 10 years, maybe three or four cases um, that, that uh, change the change the analysis somewhat. So you, but but it's still a very high burden on the part of the property owner to show that the government um, uh, distinction between one classification and another uh, is is unsupported by any rationality. Hmm. Thank you. In other words, it's a tough case, but not impossible. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Before, uh, and under Tong, under the Lee case, it was almost impossible. Not so much anymore. Wow. Um, all right, so this next question is um, a little long. I'm going to just mm -hmm. kind of paraphrase HRS 127A, mm -hmm. um, which states, in the event of a state of emergency, the governor may relieve hardships and inequities or obstructions to the public health, safety, or welfare that the governor finds exists in the law or as a result of federal programs operation by suspending that law or provision. Um, so the question is, don't federal programs preempt state emergency management? Actually, no. I mean, my understanding is they worked hand in hand. They work hand in hand. And much of the federal aid and, and federal operations under what's called the Stafford Act, which is a federal statute, are triggered by state and local declarations of emergency. So for the most part, they work hand, they work together, and they don't work in conflict. 
Um, you know, normally if a federal law occupies the area and conflicts with state law, well, the federal law controls. But the, I don't think I have not seen a case where a court has said that these these two different emergency management response um, statutes, one being federal, the other being state, are actually in conflict. That they they read them to work together, and I think that's the way it was intended to be because you do see a lot of federal and state and local coordination um, in the last couple of months. So the short answer is don't federal manage, federal programs preempt state emergency management? No. Thank you. Yes. Um, another question, how can sunshine laws be suspended during a time when transparency is extremely important? And yep. is there any way to access info related to changes in laws other than during an emergency period? I'm not sure I understand the last part of that question, but the first part of that question is, how does the governor have the power to suspend Chapter 92, the Sunshine Law? Well, the yes. short answer is, chapter, you know, Section 127A.14 says he can. He can suspend any law, um, any statute, uh, and he decided, says, well, that one was a little bit clunky uh, to, to be used. It, it would interfere with emergency responses during the, during the emergency. I therefore suspend that law. And if you look at one of his, either the initial proclamation or one of the in first supplemental proclamations that the governor's offered issued, he listed a whole section, a whole bunch of statutes that are being suspended. Um, yeah. So the short answer is uh, the governor has the power to do that because the legislature gave him the power in, in, okay. in that section. I mean, that's the short answer. I'm not quite, can you repeat that the second part of the question? Because I'm not sure I understood that. Yeah, the second part was how can the public access information related to changes in laws, whether it's happening during a state of emergency or otherwise? Well, you know, uh, uh, thank God for the web, you know, both in emergency <laughs> and non-emergency. Let's put it that way. Uh, uh, our government has become much more accessible online. You don't have to go down to the, to the archives or the legislature to pick up the latest versions. You can follow along online. Uh, for the most part, I've, my experience is they've been keeping up pretty well um, during the, let me forward up here, by the way, and forward, whoopsie, there we go. So, uh, but, but, you know, during times of emergency, yeah, it could become tougher. My one-stop shop is the governor's website, um, because in there, there's a, a current list of what statutes the governor has suspended uh, or said, you know, may not apply during, during an emergency. So that to me is where I go to go check what the latest is on what's suspended, especially those nine. Let's go back to that. This, it's this site right here. Um, and I will post a link to that on my blog where you can go just click on it and go right to here, listing the emergency proclamations. Each of those will tell you what's been suspended and the time, the time limits, if any, for each one. So that's, the, that's where I would go. That's great. That actually answers another another okay. question. Okay, good. <laughs> Killing two birds with one stone there. And I'll move on to another one that may have the same answer um, mm -hmm. as far as the gov governor has the ability to really do anything at this time, close to anything. Um, and that is, in the state's constitution, it sets forth in Article 13, Section 2, mm -hmm. that persons in public employment shall have the right to organize for the purpose of collective bargaining as provided by law. And then of course, during um, state of emergencies, the governor can suspend chapter 89, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and then so the question is, does the governor have the authority to suspend a statute that carries out a constitutional right, such as the right of public employees to collective bargaining? Yes, with limitations. And that limitation is certain rights are beyond the power of the government or the governor to suspend. Um, one, your federal constitutional rights, of which collective bargaining is not a federal constitutional rights. Um, uh, so for instance, if the governor said, we're going to commandeer property and not pay you for it, that would be a problem because the federal constitution, the Fifth Amendment says that if there's been a, a taking by eminent domain, that the government has to pay you. It can't say no. So uh, uh, I think that's one answer. So uh, generally speaking, a governor, the governor, Hawaii's governor is given the authority under section 127A14 to suspend the law, uh, the statute. He cannot, of course, suspend the, cons the Hawaii constitution, but if you look at the, the provision in the Hawaii constitution 
the key passage in there would be as provided by law. So in other words, the question would be that, that a lawyer, how a lawyer would look at that is ask, is the right to collective bargaining self-executing? In other words, does it need the statute in order to be effective? And I think the short answer to that would be yes. If that's the case, then the governor can suspend the statute without affecting um, the constitutional right. If he cannot do so, for example, the Fifth Amendment, the, con the eminent domain provision that I was just mentioning, has been held by the courts to be self-executing. In other words, it doesn't need a statute being adopted by the legislature in order to affect it. It is already a requirement of the Constitution itself and doesn't need a statute. In those cases, uh, the governor could not suspend a statute of, uh, in an emergency and the right would, would be enforceable and in continuance during an emergency. My own thinking is this is probably not one of those rights because of the phase as provided by law. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, this last question, which I see we have five minutes, um, is actually a multiple uh, part. <laughs> okay, I'll try to write them down. I'll, I'll try to write down the parts so I can keep them well, I'll, track I'll of them. Okay. Um, the first part is how are people's rights to privacy, specifically privacy of medical information, affected during states of emergencies? That's a huge question, right? Because one thing, um, Hawaii Constitution has an expressed right of privacy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the United States Constitution does not have an express provision or amendment saying you have a right to privacy, but it's been implied and inferred by the Supreme Court over the years that you have those rights. The difference is Hawaii, when we had the Constitutional Convention, we included an express provision in the Hawaii Constitution about privacy, giving uh, the residents of Hawaii, people in Hawaii, the right, or recognizing, I should say, recognizing their right to privacy. But I think what answers this question um, is, for the most part, uh, the, I think the courts will give a lot of leeway to um, the governor and health authorities if it's challenged. Say, oh, I don't want to, for example, um, in order to travel and get on a plane, I need to tell them where I've been for the past three days. Um, okay. I don't want to do that because I have a right to privacy. Um, my guess is that will look a lot like uh, to the court, uh, the, the case that, you know, uh, the case about Hansen's disease from 1884 that we talked about earlier, that the overriding public need to uh, control and respond to um, uh, a pandemic, uh, there's no such thing as an absolute right. And that's something that the United States Supreme Court recognized in the um, uh, inoculation, the vaccine case that I mentioned. To me, that is sort of the paradigmatic example of how far the government's uh, power to respond to an emergency, a public health emergency can go, because is there anything more invasive than having your body pierced by, you know, a needle? Um, yeah. It's a physical invasion of your body. And I think anything short of that, uh, the courts are going to see as a necessary measure, um, as long as there's some rationality to what the government is doing. It cannot be that there's no science to support it. There has to be a modicum of science behind it for them to ask you these questions, for example. Uh, so I think like any right you have, it's a strong right, but it's always subject to things like the public health. So, yeah. so I've, I'd have to see in a particular case, but no right is absolute. That would be my answer on that one. So the right of privacy isn't going to be the total wall against the government finding out things that might be useful to respond to coronavirus. So if someone um, did not want to fill out, for example, the travel form, inner island or mainland travel form that um, we have going on right now, does that mean that the airlines or the Department of Health could prevent that person from traveling at that time? Yeah, knowing so, nothing else in that, in that hypothetical situation, I would say the, the presumption would be that yes, uh, the government and the airlines uh, could do that, that it, it, would not, it would not be a problem if you refuse to fill it out. Mm -hmm. And then the last part of this question is, um, what are other scenarios when this sort of data collection could be legally allowed other than 
um, during an emergency period? Or is it the only time the collection of this sort of health information would be allowed? That's a, you know, I, I didn't, I, I'll promise you, I didn't plant that question because <laughs> it was going to be, I was, it, it brings me to a point that I wanted to make um, before uh, we sign off. And that goes back to the idea of what I call the playground constitution, the one that exists in our collective consciousness versus the one that exists, you know, in the, in the, in the law books. Our collective consciousness, I think, has, has these rules. And, and one of them is, you can't make me do stuff I don't want to do. In normal times, why, should, why does that change when we're in emergency times? Well, in normal times, the government can assert a huge amount of influence over the way we run our businesses, the way we go out in public, the way we get on a plane, the way we get off a plane, uh, the way we use our property, uh, the what, what kind of house we can build, um, all sorts of things. So I, as a lawyer, don't think of an emergency situation as being much different than a normal time. The government has a huge amount of control over what we can do. Um, and so I think the, the answer to that question is we're just more aware of it now during an emergency because it, it has extended to the point past what we're used to. But you, you go back in time and you ask a Hawaii citizen in the 1840s, in, in the cases we were talking about, and they would, you know, were there regulations about when they could go out and do this, even in a non-emergency, they would find, they would look at the way we, how, how our lives are regulated every day by the government and think that's just obscene, probably. They wouldn't understand the level of regulation. What do you mean? that before I build my house, I have to go get permission from you know, the city or I have to do an environmental impact study. That would mm -hmm. seem completely nuts to someone 150 years ago, yet today we consider it completely normal. And so my, my takeaway from this is that in normal times, the government has a huge amount of control over and exercises a huge amount of control over what we can do all in the name of protecting us from each other and the, and the, the public health. It's not that much different uh, in times like now. It's just that we're much more aware of it, I think. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't challenge these things, you know. Um, I mean, my, my point being that you should always be vigilant, you know. Our, our, you as good citizens need to spam up. Keep on your elected. Keep on your elected representatives. Don't necessarily rely on the courts to to protect you, because as we've seen, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot one way or the other. We don't know. You can't predict how a case will come out, and so use your use your powers to contact your representatives and get them to listen to you. You don't like these restrictions. You need to find, you need to be calling the governor's office. You need to be calling your representative or your senator's office and tell them to do something about it. Mm. Well, thank you. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful um, way to end this discussion we've had. And I want to say thank you. We've had over 70 people um, wow. join in. Questions have been really fabulous. And thank you, Robert. Um, I've been, I feel like I've gotten a lesson from one of your William and Mary Law courses. So nah. this Fabulous. Um, this was fantastic. Um, and thank you so much. And I hope everyone takes care. Otherwise, yes. I think yes. we're, we're at time. So looks like it. Um, and I do want to, you know, uh, if you have any questions that I might be able to answer, here's my email. Follow me on Twitter. I will post up on the blog uh, no later than tomorrow. Uh, the cases and the statutes and the other things that we've talked about. So if you want to go read them yourself and, and see whether I I'm, I'm, know what I'm talking about or I don't, there will be right there for you to go read. Awesome. And um, I'll share the YouTube video with you as well so you can share that on your platforms. Oh, neat. Okay, great. More. Um, but otherwise, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening, and take care. Okay. Aloha, everyone. Good night. Cool.